podcasts, the droning. Just get to the point, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Geek in This Episode 3, where we will be discussing Netflix's You. I don't know why I have an announcer voice on right now. I apologize. <laughs> I'm just getting into the mo there. Um, but, anyways, moving right along. Um, so, welcome to Geek in This Part 3, where we will be t- wrapping up Netflix's You with the last five episodes. So with me, as always, is Mr. Tony. Hey, man. Uh, lifelong, lifelong friends and geeks. I am uh, Peter. We co-host this podcast, this geek podcast, together about pop culture and all the things in it. And we really get into the nit and gritty of um, these pop culture things, such as Netflix's You. And we discussed exactly what we watched, what we liked, and it's it's all in the goal of trying to find something new to get into. Yeah. Right, and at least that's how I like to see it. Because I'm running, honestly, I'm running out of things to watch on Netflix. I don't know if you're the same way. But I go, uh, I mean, like, I have a backlog of stuff, but then I'm like, I don't really want to, I don't know, there's always that sort of initial of, like, I need to psych myself up into getting into something. But what's great with this is you actually got me into you, so I was actually able to watch that. Do you have a, not to go off on a tangent, but do you have sort of similar feelings towards Netflix? Yeah, I mean, like you said, I have a backlog as well, but I think I'm not going to actually get into it unless if it's recommended personally by somebody I know, because all the critics can recommend it to me or Netflix algorithm can recommend it to me, but that doesn't mean bananas unless if it's a real human being telling me, you got to check this out. And I would say it goes in the opposite side of the scale too, because I've heard bad um, things about the new season of Luke Cage and then the new season of Iron Fist. I've heard lots of bad things about that on the internet. But if I heard from a friend or if a friend came up to me and said, hey, you should give Iron the new season of Iron Fist a shot, I would definitely do that and listen to that friend more so than uh, people on the internet. But yeah. the goal is not to dismiss all of you that are listening right now, <laughs> but the goal is, is to make all of us friends so we all trust each other to give these things a shot. Yeah, I, I agree 100% with that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm sort of in a, a weird phase with Netflix right now, especially since um, Disney Plus is coming along. I am not so sure if I wanted to hold on to my Netflix subscription. Ah, Peter, you're one of those guys. You want to give I, all your money. <laughs> I mean, yeah, goddamn, Disney's already ruling the world, and that is fine by me, good sir. They can take all my money. Ah, damn. All right. <laughs> I, I, it's I, I swear it's a lesser evil than other things out there. Yeah, well, that's a whole other discussion. But yeah, that's a whole other discussion for a different podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're getting into Netflix's You. Um, this has been a little bit of a spell for us. We had a little break there, but uh, going back into it is pretty awesome. Um. I just want to give our overall sort of opinions of uh, the ending of you. So, um, Mr. Tony, sir, how did you feel like you ended as a whole? I think it was very satisfying. Uh, it, I mean, obviously, we can get into, like, the content of it and how it messed up it was. But as a whole, in terms of, like, the plot and the overall story arc, I think it, it hit all the checkboxes that I was looking for. Um, it did a nice, um, it kind of went back to the beginning a little bit in terms of talking about Candace. And so there was a big reveal about that. And we finally got a satisfying end in terms of knowing about what was the fate of, um, not only Paco, but Paco's stepdad. And so it was just a really, like, it almost felt like the end, like the last three episodes were accelerated. Oh my sense. god, yes. No, it t- makes total sense. So, um, I was the new guy getting into this. Tony had already finished it up. Um, what 
was very amazing to me is exactly what you said in our last podcast and discussion of it was that it's almost a completely different show by this midpoint. It takes, and at this uh, ending, it takes a really crazy turn and it's, it's almost like two different shows within the show. You got like a more of a, I thought maybe, I don't want to like bad mouth it or anything, but I felt like it was more of a predictable show in the first half of this season. But then yeah. by the time it gets to the turn into the last half of the season is really unpredictable. I, I really didn't know where it was going. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Um, so actually, before we really get into the nitty gritty, I wanted to ask you because I was the one who recommended this from the beginning and talk, talking it up. I think part of the reason why I was really talking it up is because I had just come off the ride. So when you just finish something and you just finish <laughs> like the best episode, you're just like, oh my god, I want to discuss this with other people. Um, again, you bad mouth all you want. I know it is like a roller coaster and it takes its time just a bit, but I thought overall it was well paced enough to recommend. It. Yes, totally. Um, you know, uh, I would say this before. Um, there are certain parts I liked about it in the first half that I watched, but I wouldn't say I was a fan. Right. Like after the second half of the season, yeah, I am a fan and I am hooked and I can't wait to see where it's going next. Oh, that's exciting to hear. Oh, that, yeah. that's, that's been talked about. Um, Go ahead. Let, let's get into it. Let's talk yeah, about so the... We're going to get into it right now. Um, So, yeah. So, I would, if you're starting to watch it, I would say bear with it because it gets pretty cost, awesome and crazy. I was going to say cross them. So, that's a new word. <laughs> awesome and <laughs> crazy together. Um. Slight housekeeping. It, the whole season was on Lifetime Point. It was available on the website. You can watch the whole season there. And then Netflix picked it up. It's sort of a, a show that Netflix revived, and they've done this before with shows. So it, I think it was a mutual partnership with Lifetime. But uh, next season will definitely be in the hands of Netflix. Own. Yeah, so I wonder what that's going to mean for the style. I you know I think maybe what we're talking about, and maybe what we noticed with between the first half and second half of the show, is maybe since uh, the show did not know if it was going to continue with Lifetime or not, maybe that's when um, Netflix and their producers picked up. Yeah, because like you said, it literally does feel like a slightly different atmosphere. So I wonder if the dark atmosphere is going to continue because there are a couple yes. episodes in the beginning when it does feel a, a little like to me. For example, when they go to the, um, the fair or the book fair, I think it was like, that was, that was still fun for me, but yes, it didn't necessarily feel like a Netflix show. And so I would be really excited and curious to see if what angle they take in the next yes. season. I think that's exactly, um, that's exactly it. The first half is sort of a, a traditional, maybe not traditional lifetime show, and then the second half definitely feels like it's a Netflix show. Because I say that because I think Netflix shows have this attitude about them where they like we can do whatever we want. <laughs> yeah, like literally, like Stephen King said it best: uh, "Kill your darlings." You know, like you build yes. up a character and you really like put all this energy in be behind them, and then you just freaking kill them off. <laughs> yes, <laughs> all that work exactly. for. So, yeah. Classic, classic writing. If uh, anyone's boning up on some writing, this is actually a really good show to watch if you're into writing because not only is Beck talking about it and that's her career, but it's a really good, uh, you can see those sort of archetypes and how this show turns those archetypes, those character archetypes upside down and just it, it is a really good show for like twists and turns if you're studying any of that in like writing at all. Yeah. Um, all right, Peter, okay, take it away. So, episode number one, we're hot off the presses right after uh, the mysterious attack on Peach Salinger, where uh, we know it was actually <laughs> Joe who did it and who was stalking her. Um, she survived, uh, and Joe, having come off a, a savage beating by Paco's stepdad, whose name I never got. Did we ever get a name? You know what? That's a really good question. I <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if if we did, it wasn't very memorable. <laughs> okay, so um, what is interesting is uh, 
this wraps up one of the nemesis that we were talking about, Peach. Um, so we said the past, the two nemesis have to be Peach and Paco's stepdad. So this wraps up Peach's story. And I'm actually glad that they dealt with it within one episode. I thought Peach was going to stay throughout the whole season. Uh, having learned that she survived the attack, I thought she was going to be in all these episodes. Right. So um, we learn that uh, she survived, that she wants to confiscate Beck for her own purposes, that because she's in love with Beck, she'll take her, hide her away in peace. But before so, she goes to a family estate, uh, like uptown New York or something. Um, of course, Joe um, says, okay, go ahead. But, you know, he's he's obviously trailing them and stalking them. And he gets in some of the best high tension situations ever in that episode. And it's just awkward to watch and really thrilling to watch. It's really good. Um, in this episode, we see more candidates from flashbacks with Joe because he has an injury and he starts hallucinating a little bit. And that's interesting to see as well. Um, so that was our first hints of the sort of the Candace story, which we'll get into later. <laughs> so I want to ask you, sir, how did you feel about, spoiler alert, Peach's eventual farewell to the series? You know, I... <laughs> How did I feel? <laughs> well, well, um, I, I, you know, this. how did you feel? Do you remember what you felt then when you watched it? And how do you feel now after completing? Uh, well, there, there are two different feelings because once the sh series ends, sh her story is almost irrelevant because it's almost a side note. Yes, I agree. Right. And, but, but when it happens in that moment, it is like a big, like, so anyway, I guess where I was going with this is I was kind of curious to see how Joe was going to live with the fact that he murdered Peach um, based on the fact that he still wanted to be in, uh, in, in, a, in a relationship with Beth. So it's like, hmm, how is that going to play out? So that was just kind of confusing more than anything. Uh, when it actually happened, I was like, holy crap, this is insane because he tried once, right, hit her on the head, but that didn't work. And so for him to try it again, <laughs> this is the second time of the yeah, that's true. And then actually, I thought that something was you know what was interesting. I thought something was going to happen. I think it's in that same episode we're talking about. I'm not sure if it led anywhere, but remember that cop that pulled him over. Um, it slightly did. That cop plays a purpose in getting um back into the Candace sort of investigation. Yes. Yeah. Well. Hmm. No, I guess I mean to say that the cop was outside Peach's house, and he That's was like running his right, and he was kind of like yeah. questioning, "Why are you here?" And yeah. so I, 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 and then that cop was definitely knew something was up, but I guess uh, the charm, the charm that um, Joe yeah. has, yes, exactly, was able to win him over. And what, I think that what that is able to kick off is sort of because um, I believe shoot. I want to say the cop calls um, their place, Beck and Joe's place, and I. So the cop calls Beck and Joe's place, and I want to say that that's when Beck gets suspicious because I think she answers the call. I might be wrong. I thought the cop actually called the bookstore, and Joe. Oh, answered. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Uh, oh, oh yeah, it was no. I think there's two separate times. So oh. one, yes, he did call, and Joe answered. This was... Ooh. Well, yes, because... no, okay, so this was, yeah, I'm sorry. The person who gets back suspicious is actually the private investigator who uh, yeah. searches about um, Peach's demise. Demo. <laughs> yeah, right, because his, Peach's family is like, something's up here, she couldn't have done this. And you know what? Now that I think about it, wait, do they even like elaborate on how Joe killed her? Because I know he shot her. I think he's, yeah. but, but the point is like, 
did he do it in such a way and he didn't have a lot of time because they were in a scuffle so it doesn't make sense that it was predeterminated like did he do it in a way in the moment in which it looked like she had killed herself like shot herself in the head right because if he had shot her in like the heart for example then in the chest then I would be suspicious if I was a family. Like, um, so my theory is on this, and they never show it, and it's it's really a it's a great um scene, great awful scene. Uh, but my understanding is, spoiler alert again. Well, everything's being spoiled here. Um, he makes it so it sounds like, and it seems like that Peach committed suicide, which she, we've seen in the past, and she's contemplated it or yeah, but she's contemplating done it. it. But she's done it with medication in the past. Yeah, yeah. Not with uh, a gun. So here in this struggle, um, I believe there is there definitely is a struggle. Uh, Joe is definitely on the ground, but maybe he eventually gets the upper hand is on top of her. Or I don't know what happens. But I think uh, oof, I think the key thing is that somehow Joe is able to have position of the gun but while peach is holding it and then he uses peach's hands to self i believe that is what it is implied okay yeah i actually would buy that and so okay think about that right not to get too specific but what this means is joe is smart in that moment to be able to determine hey there's this there's only really one way i can do this because if i do this any other number of ways, then I'm going to become suspicious. And so that tells me, and check this out, and this is important to the larger story arc, that Joe has a history of knowledge on how to commit crime so that he can get away with it. <laughs> and, and so, I mean, there's a lot going on here, man. They're rolling around. So there, you got to imagine there's a lot of fingerprint evidence all over Peach's body. So somehow he has to sanitize that. Uh, he has to be able to make up an alibi for where he was at that time. There's so many things that could have gone wrong that did not go wrong. Right. Which this tells is a, you, that was a really good point. This almost seems like it's like a, a serial killer's like origin story because you kind of get that sense with Joe. I'm not sure. See where I'm where I'm going with this angle. That's a good analogy. Uh, I, um, that's a good um, theory. But where I'm going with it, I think this guy has a long history of bodies behind him. Oh, already. I don't think it's uh, the yeah, first time in the rodeo. Really, that's true. Um, and we do get a sense of that because we have a flashback with uh, his mentor um, that he's killed before in the past. So maybe this is, yeah, this is just one of the bodies on top of the bigger pile of bodies that he already has but it's never really elaborated on and but you that's know a good point. well i mean and not you know i don't want to get ahead of the podcast here but once we hit the last episode and we discuss that last episode um it it certainly feels like um <laughs> beck was not the first i mean clearly there's candace but if there was candace and then there was beck so, uh, so you're saying there's uh someone else who we fixated on how many people has Joe been involved with? And how many people has he murdered? Right. Is it only right. two? Or are we talking like dozens? Right. Okay, so let's get into... Uh, so we have that that episode that happens with Peach. Um, and then we see that that happens. And then, uh, of course, Joe has to play up uh, what happens to Peach and like uh, be there for Beck. And now Beck's in a sort of a depression. Uh, then we go into uh, what I call the breakup episode. Uh, which is the next episode, and we get introduced to Dr. Nikki. It actually starts off with um, with uh, Joe, with Dr. Nikki, and um, right after it, 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 this one does a big time skip. It does, uh, so the story is that Joe's already with Dr. Nikki, but it flashes back to how they break up, because it's uh, him explaining the story of what happened through a therapy session. Uh, so, we get Dr. Nikki, uh, who is portrayed at by Scott Bale, which is a great addition to um, the show. And uh, we get why they broke up, mostly because of uh, Beck's depression, and then like uh, thinking that it's almost too good to be true that they're together, which it is, and she re- actually is at the end as well. Um, but we get Joe 
having to make a decision of letting Beck go or continuing his manslaughter, as it were. Yeah, and isn't it around this time that Joe finds the neighbor's friend? Yes. And gets in a relationship with her. Right. So not exactly, but yes, they meet. Um, well, I think at the end of this episode, the relation starts. Uh, he meets Karen Minty, who is a friend to God Paco's mom, which I think she has him. I forgot it now. A, a nurse who helps out Paco and his mom and definitely helps his mom sober up when do crazy benders and try to help keep them away from Paco's stepdad. Um, so yeah, we meet Karen Minty here. Um, the, so that's uh, that's a key part of the story. And another key part of the story is Joe trying to um, understand if he wants to kill Dr. Nikki or not, because it's implied that Dr. Nikki is sleeping with Beck. But, yeah, but the, um, he decides not to in this episode. Well, again, so like, the episodes get kind of smushed together because it's been a while since yes. I saw the show. They, but they do, they really do. But but there is a part in which, well, the revelation was that he at that moment felt, based on the recording, that Doctor Nikki is not actually going out with um, Beck, and that. There, the reason why she's going to him is really for actual therapeutic reasons, and she's really just trying to get help. And he realizes, hey, you know what? This guy's actually a really good doctor, and he is helping her out. He has nothing to do with her in, in terms of a relationship, so he's off the hook. So he lets him go. Gosh darn! Thinking back on this episode, I have mixed feelings about it. But anyway, so wait, yes, <laughs> wait, wait, why? Well, because we fight. Uh, well, that's that's reaching into the last. Episode. Well, you know what's funny? Everything could have changed if he had just picked one more file or selected right. a different file. Right. Like, how are you only going to do one and then be like, oh, I guess like there's nothing to see here? <laughs> yeah, he starts to slip a bit in his, uh, which is great because uh, there are sort of, when they are together, there's sort of a hanging up his mantle of being this killer. He's like, okay, I'm with Beck now. I don't have to kill, don't have to stalk, don't have to be creepy. But, um, so I think that is maybe an explanation as to why, because um, he's sort of slipping in his in his now, the ways he now, used to do. Now here's the question: Is he slipping, or is he intentionally saying, "You know what? I'm good. I want to believe what I want to believe. I have circumstantial evidence that shows that Doctor Nikki's not going out with her, and so that's what I'm going to buy." Like he's just Man. trying to force himself to believe it, or is it just he's getting sloppy? I, it may be a little bit of both, but I, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> That's a great question. All right. <laughs> Let, let's say maybe both. Okay. I think both are pretty valid. Um, so, yes, so that happens. Dr. Nikki gets off. And I, I, as a viewer, stuck like Dr. Nikki, of course, because it's uh, Scott Bayo, but also he's a great character. And he's a great character as a sort of middleman between Beck and Joe. Uh, then we get into, so he decides to let Beck go off and do her thing. Uh, so Joe decides to let her go off, do her thing, and um, that's when they break up. Is just sort of, he's like, okay, she's just in therapy, nothing else is going on. And that's when he gets with Karen Minty, which is the, pretty much the whole uh, episode of, the next episode's about Karen Minty and helping out Paco and his mom. And really, they're sort of just side stories of, of each other. We just follow two different storylines for these characters until eventually they do meet up and intersect. Um, yeah. So this is uh, why I titled it Getting Back Together. And it's surprising that um, they were only apart for maybe like one episode. Uh, but uh, it does do a time jump, I think. Uh, or it's, it's sensed that it, they do a time jump. Uh, and then this one, some time has passed, but eventually they get back together because Joe can't really, they really can't quit each other, Joe or Beck. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's a good way of putting it. Um, so I would like to take uh, the chance to discuss about Karen T, uh, your feelings about her as a character. Um, what do you think? Do you think, uh, here's a question. Do you think Joe should have stayed with Karen? 
Not for her sake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, at some point, I think he would have just, I don't know, like, done something with her. But, but wasn't, uh, sort of, I felt the sense that when he was with Karen, everything was sort of fixed. Yeah. He didn't seem like he was, he was definitely more of himself, but not of the creepy way, but it seemed like the creepy way was sort of fading and he was okay with that and i i think he would have been on the men's as it were if he you know stayed what? with Kim. you know what i'll buy that because karen minty is an amazing character in my opinion i mean look at it she's a she she's a nurse she's willing to basically fight off an abusive dangerous jerk who is with a bat, <laughs> um, she nurtures yes. a, a child who's neglected. She nurses yes. her addict, addict friend. I mean, she's just kind yes. of like a really good human being. Nurses, definitely nurses Joe as well, I would add on to she, that. Yeah, she cares for her man in, in a real loving way while still calling him out on his, on his freaking bullshit when he dumps her. Um, yes. So she she's really strong. She's a strong, independent woman. So I believe that had Joe stayed with her, like let's just call it two years – Maybe she would have been able – I don't know. Maybe she would have been able to fix him. But I don't know. Once you're a killer, right. can you be fixed? And that's a whole another philosophical question. Right. That would have been a whole different series, and uh, that's that's a great what-if question. And Let I'm me ask you – answer that. Here's the ultimate what-if question. If Joe had stayed with her and had revealed his true self, you know what? I've done these things. Would Karen stay? Uh, ooh, wow. <laughs> I, wow. Um, I don't think, you know what, I'm going to say I don't think Joe would ever, ever, he's really good at keeping secrets, I don't think he would ever divulge. I think, uh, what more would happen would, uh, she would probably found out on her own. And then that's when probably shit would go down. So maybe, yeah, maybe shit would go down eventually. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. He's very self-preserved, so maybe he would just, no matter who he's with, he w matter of fact, that, you know what, I think we get a taste of that with Beck because he does ultimately tell her everything, and look how that ended up. Oh, yeah. yeah I think a similar sort of situation would have happened, but I think Karen uh, would have found a way to... Uh, well, I guess we can... <laughs> we'll get into the last episode. But I think Karen would make it out okay. How about that? <laughs> okay, yeah. All right. Let's, let's, let's get into the next episode because that's kind of where I was about to lead with that sentence. Uh, so after that, they get back together, sort of a uh, whole um, say anything moment where Joe wasn't holding a, a big old boombox over his head. Uh, it's sort of similar. He tossed a rock up there and they got back together. At the and then, uh, so this episode, I had dubbed, I mean, they actually have titles, but I forgot the titles were. But this episode, I have dubbed the uh, Candence Investigation by Beck. And uh, this one is pretty crazy. It starts off, um, so help me uh, remember, as definitely it is uh, a really Beck-centered episode where she's trying to figure out, because um, at the end of the last episode, Karen sort of gives her this clue to who Candace was, and that sets the ball rolling. But what was Joe doing in this episode? Why was he so preoccupied with that Beck was able to investigate this shit? Do you remember? Oh my gosh. Is it, no. um, is it just dealing with Paco stuff? It might be dealing with Paco stuff. I almost... Was it that, or was it the setting up for the party? Oh, yeah, and then the whole thing of uh, making her a birthday party, and um, yeah, I think it, it was more probably that, yeah, definitely. Oh, wait, no, no, that was when they broke up. Oh, yeah, that's true. Jeez, I don't know, maybe he was just running the bookstore? I, I honestly... <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to... Oh, man, but yeah, so um, he's preoccupied with something, or maybe just Beck is... Uh, charms her, is her way into like sort of shooing him off and investigating on her own but she investigates she's under suspicions of joe what exactly happened and then to prove that those suspicions 
or ultimately correct when she, um, with Paco sort of another gives another clue that, hey, Joe told me to the best place to hide shit is uh, above the toilet in the bathroom. And so she does that and finds a lovely little box. Yeah. <laughs> That's messed up. <laughs> that is messed uh, up. So it's a box of uh, what Joe calls mementos, but really are things you can't really dispose of without people looking at you funny. Um, what includes freaking Keith, who in uh, which is great in uh, the scene, Peach. I mean, I assumes they're Peach's teeth, but they actually turn out to be. Um, God, what is his name? God, why am I blanking on names now? That guy, uh, whatever. His Benji, name is. Benji. Yeah, yes. Benji. <laughs> That's right. So it actually turns out to be Benji's teeth. Uh, he has an heirloom of uh, Candice. I forget what it was. I think jewelry of some sort. And pretty much uh, something from everyone he's killed. <laughs> Including, you know what? I think, uh, that when the main thing was, uh, was it Peach's gun or no? I don't think uh, he had Peach's gun. But he had something of Peach, too. You, you know what? Actually, going back to the question I posed at the beginning... I said, how many times has Joe done this before? And the fact that we only see remnants of, of Peach and Benji makes me think, hmm, maybe he really only is, is new to this and only did this a couple times. But then again, I kind of feel like maybe... But he knows. Uh, I would go with what you're originally thinking because he goes... He knows what to do with this stuff. He knows that to hide the stuff. And I feel like he probably hid other stuff from other people. Down you know the way what? And maybe even disposed of them secretly. Maybe. I think you're right. I think you. You know what? That might be true. That he just decided. You know what? Um, I'm not gonna keep those mementos anymore because they're no longer relevant to me. Because I don't want any memory of Candace, for example. Yes. Uh, so to not give the whole scene away, they have a scuffle. It's a great tense, tense scene of like. I gotta better make sure he knows that I didn't find the box and like playing off of each other and then uh, ultimately ends up with Joe uh, knocking out Beck and then placing in his fungin, his fun dungeon as it were, <laughs> fungin. Of, uh, under the books. Yeah, yeah, under the bookstore, that's where, that's where he puts everyone because that's what he was taught from his uh, creepy mentor. Yeah. Um, so that leads us into the final episode, which, wow, um, so many, it was great, because uh, just talking about this, I hadn't thought about this show in maybe like four or five days, and just to think about all this shit that went down, it's crazy. Um, so the finale is really awesome. Um, I think all throughout these last episodes, we definitely get, I don't know if because uh, it was like his past injury, or if he's just... Um, remembering the past but we definitely get lots of flashbacks with candace and she's like throughout this whole thing um so beck is there trapped and joe will not release her until she fully understands that everything he did is for her her um yes for her and uh that she he wants her to actually write while she's trapped there which is ridiculous <laughs> yeah um, god i don't even know where to begin with this episode uh, shoot. Yeah, how about this? So do you have anything to ask me since I was the new guy watching this stuff? Um, well, <laughs> okay, so there's multiple reasons why people do bad things. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead a little, just a tiny bit. And we can we can kind of revisit this episode from the beginning, take it from the top. No, just but, skip as much as you want. <laughs> well, okay, all right. So the big, big question is, Paco freaking hears Beck. He sees her. He does oh, not open yeah. the door. He does not open the door. Question for you. Why do you yes. think he did not let her go? I, well, I give, I'll, well, I'll give you two, and then you okay. can give me mine. Number sure. one, it's, it's the simplistic masculinity of the bro code, right? He wants to look out for Joe uh. because Joe's look out for him. Or... I mean, there, it's not an either or. There could be multiple answers. But the other one that I think is a top two contender for why he doesn't let it go is he actually doesn't want to get in trouble. And and what oh, I mean by that is like he that. doesn't he, he just doesn't want to get involved in the situation. Oh, uh, the cops are going to think I was involved. Or he's doing it for himself, not for Joe. 
see both. Uh, I didn't even think of the second one. I think that's really good. That's definitely it. the mind of a child. Is like uh, I don't want to get. Uh, I don't want even if he doesn't want to get in trouble, he just doesn't want to deal with any of this shit. That's actually a very good poll because I think that's more of how a child mind works. Right. But uh, I was leaning more towards. I wouldn't call it the bro code. But there's definitely this trust and bond between... Oh my god, now I remember what was preoccupying Joe in the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is, uh, um, there is the uh, uh, understand and bond and trust between Paco and Joe. And it's because going back to the last episode, we're like, whoa, what was Joe doing? Joe he was, was taking was care of Paco. His mom. Yes. Yes, and then Joe ends up killing um, Paco's stepdad and thus freeing Paco and his mom from all that. And then well, that's it, it Joe wasn't... and Paco's secret. Yeah. Wait, did pa- Wait a minute. I'm not sure if Joe actually killed Paco's stepdad. Oh, I'm sorry. Stepdad. I, I, I restate. Uh, Paco did. And then it, Joe helps him sort of. He's modeling his own little version of himself. And then. Joe sort of takes care of the body and it's all this sort of thing. Yeah. So 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 back to that. So you think it's more of like a bond between? It's more Joe. of a yes, yeah, bond between them, understanding that hey, I'm gonna do shit. Sometimes you got. I think what Joe says is sometimes you gotta do bad things for like good people or to make things good or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I wanted to ask you, and I also wanted to say, um, well, yeah, now that we're at the end, okay, so this is another crazy question. The obvious, the obvious reveal is that Candace is still alive, right? That's the big reveal. Yes. Oh, that was, and, uh, but, yeah, that that's definitely. I think uh, before we do mention that, let's talk about Beck. And I was almost convinced that Beck, um, she, I guess she's actually a good actress. That Beck was actually, she wrote something for Joe as a sort of means to get out of the cell or to make him trust him so that she can get out. And then yeah. um, eventually that she, he actually kills her, which I never thought he would ever do. I thought we would see Beck into season two, still trapped down there. But um, then she, yeah, then we have to say, I think we have to say farewell to Beck before we get on to Candace. Well, wasn't it a ultimate irony that you know she she does she's a great actress because she goes into this kind of three different modes. Like first of all, is you're a psychopath, let me go, and then he yes. doesn't res- he doesn't respond to that. So then she's like, okay, you know what, I do care about you, and then he's still kind of not buying it. So then she's like, aha, I have this brilliant idea. He wants me to write. What I can do is I can write my way out of this by creating up this story to clean up all the. Lim- Yes. And let me go and we can live happily ever after and kind of make him buy that and then she does and he convinces her she convinces him i mean and the great irony here is with such a good story that she wrote to tie up all the loose ends the last second she decides to kind of um you know escape turn it she, yeah she messes up and he has the freaking like i guess an, an extra key a spare, she, key a spare key which is crazy and um, the ultimate irony is that he uses her own story against her, and he's like, "Wow, what a good idea!" All the plot, <laughs> yeah, he still has it. And then only the only thing he has to do differently is instead of uh, uh, he just makes it so that the doctor's the bad guy. Yeah, so they pin everything on Doctor Nikki, and this part, um, he's almost about to kill Doctor Nikki because he does find out that they were indeed having an affair, which is why we had mixed feelings about the previous episode. Um, and then so he lets him live, but then he pins all of this on Doctor Nikki. Doctor Nikki gets arrested, and then just yeah, what a what a farewell to Beck. Um, uh, I definitely going into the show, I was not a Beck fan, but now I think I do appreciate her a bit more, and that I just never thought it would uh, <laughs> would end this way, dear Lord. <laughs> Dude is so messed up. Like he's out there, like selling her book <laughs> because like as crazy as joe is i think the silver lining was like i well i believed in my head anyways that he would never do anything like that to becca because everything he's doing is for Beck, so he shouldn't do anything like that to Beck. but yeah. i guess he breaks his golden rule there at the end and yeah uh that was, or that was that. or maybe maybe it's not that 
his love for Beck was the golden rule. I think the ultimate right. goal, I think the golden rule is self preservation. Right, because looking back on it, and you're saying that maybe there was more, and even maybe even before Candace, maybe there was even more. Like who knows how many victims? And like you bring up a good point, so maybe it's uh, it's us as the audience getting fooled and fooled into Joe's belief that he's maybe he's a killer with a heart of gold, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah, he's no Dexter. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. He so, actually yeah. Does, he doesn't really do it for others he does it just for himself i guess right so yeah so maybe that's the distinction there and maybe uh, there have been more and yeah who knows we can't obviously i'm um, going into the next season i'm obviously gonna not trust joe as much but i'm excited to see uh candace that that reveal was ridiculous because it's implied that she died somehow or maybe it's not really stated maybe um it's it's very strongly implied. I mean, all the clues yeah, are there. Yeah, yeah. Like so maybe she, she dies in a way that um could go either way. Maybe she like Joe like cuts the brake, gets off her car, and she just sails off a cliff or something. It's like oh, she's probably dead, but maybe she survived somehow. Well, uh, you know, it's great because she knows what's up. She's one of those characters who are on to Joe's bullshit. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is like you said is all, clearly Joe is shocked. He's like, what the hell? You're alive? Yes, which makes which yes. makes me think that he definitely thought he succeeded in killing her. He didn't. Like you said, I like your idea of cutting her brakes off and then maybe she makes a run for it at the last second. But the, the point is, okay, so this character who Joe thought he uh, murdered is gone. Does that mean there's a potential that Beck is still alive? Because he thought he'd got rid of Candace. Oh, no. There it's... Because, um, just like Peach, Beck's death sort of happens on slash off camera. So I think it's more strongly implied that that, that happened. But Candace was never even mentioned. We didn't even get a flashback of her death. We didn't know what was going on there. So there, uh, there's more ambiguity there. Um, so I think Beck, just like Peach's death, it was more final. Okay, so then let me ask you this. Um, again, it's it's literally she's literally introduced as a like, hey, I'm right here, and he's like, ah, oh shit, you're real. My question yes. is, do you think there's a possibility Candace is not a real person and he's hallucinating? Oh. That I mean, that's good. That's a good way to take it too. But hmm, man, yeah, it could go either way. She could be a figment of his imagination still. But I feel like what's more likely is that she's actually there somehow, and somehow we're afraid of how how she came to survive. Okay, I, I think it's a mysterious death, but I think Joe wasn't really directly in. In, but you, definitely involved in, but like uh, I think something. I feel like this is his first sort of killing, so maybe he didn't do such a great job at it. And yeah. there had to been uh, some mystery there to whether her death was final or not. Ah, uh, okay, all right. Well, um, so I actually want to get into something kind of fun. So check yes. this out. I have a crazy fan theory. This is just my own. I made up all. My Ooh, I like fan theories. So, so this is a um a multiverse theory of mine. What if um Joe is actually I don't know if you ever saw Dexter the full show, did you? Yes. Yep. Okay. Dude, what if Joe is actually Dexter's son, Harrison? Oh wow. <laughs> because we never see because clearly that that bookkeeper is not his actual dad. Right, right. No, we know that. We know we that. Know that. And, and he obviously doesn't have a mom either. We don't see right. her. His whole background is very ambiguous. And his tendencies are Dexter-like, but not really uh, – let, let's put it this way. He doesn't have a figure to tell him – the moral code, because Dexter has a strong code, kill bad sure. people. Oh, wow, well, so he's like a bad form of Dexter, but without sort of Dexter's grounded uh, 
ground oh, rules there. Yes, the yes. And I maybe, uh, you know, after because I know that in the last episode of Dexter, I guess um, his his girl at the time, his girlfriend at the time takes Harrison all the way down, I think South America. So what if like she just decides or abandon him or maybe she just decides to take him back to New York or something happens to her and he just finds himself at the bookstore by himself. I don't know. Right. I really I really like this theory. There's not a lot connecting it, but I personally love it and I think I want to make it work somehow. <laughs> that that's a, I love that theory and definitely it could be um cuz the bookstore god I don't re- can't remember his name from the show but um the bookstore owner from you is definitely uh, weird enough where he might he may have been eccentric and gone to like a, to Africa in a trip or something. That's exactly. definitely imply that uh, Joe was adopted and maybe he was adopted there or maybe he was adopted somehow in New York. But yeah, that could definitely work. My question is, and I don't know if you know, I definitely don't know. Is uh, there any sort of other connections to Dexter? Is uh, any writers have they worked on Dexter and then you or? That's a great question. Dang, I should have researched that before the show. Dang. Oh, my gosh. I don't know. Um, damn. I don't know. Uh, if, if there were, then there's more fuel to the fire there, and that definitely would be make it more a little more grounded. But, yeah, I love that theory, too. If Yeah, that's, just, uh, that's a great theory. Just Because to, to, we saw so many similarities, or we were always <laughs> comparing the two shows. But that, that's a way to sort of <laughs> marry it together. Yeah, um, honestly, I, I'm going to have to get back to this one because I, I want to do more research yeah. in terms of the writers. Yeah. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. We will develop it, and I, I like to – if uh, when I, I'd like to say we'll never get done with a topic here, and we'll yeah. always find time to bring something up if we thought about it, say like for Dragon Ball or Netflix is You, always time to go back and revisit things. So, yeah, that's definitely – something I would yeah. look forward to. You know, actually, um, before um, Ao was introduced, I thought he was going to be um, Joe's dad. I didn't think he was going to be a therapist. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's interesting. That is really interesting. I yeah, don't know. I think that, I that would be that. a different show. I think uh, maybe I felt like maybe Joe's dad would be more of a so, so, so pretty much a Dexter, but in the form of Scott <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, um, real quickly, I just cheated and I did a quick Google search for um, Dexter and, and uh, Joe, and somebody on the internet pointed out. Oh, um, great. Th- somebody said there was a flashback where Mooney was telling young Joe that he knows he has demons inside him and that he was teaching him. Oh, about- oh wow. so so he doesn't end up like his father. Oh my gosh! Um, so somehow he knows Dexter too. That's yeah, that's, right. that's great. Oh man. Okay, I'm gonna connect the dots more. <laughs> yes, and, and we will develop together. this series and submit it out there. Definitely. Wow, that's great. Cool. So go man. on. Now I want to watch. Uh, so yeah, I think <laughs> that's a wrap up on uh, Netflix's You here. Lots of mixed feelings. Um, I just to point out um if you go into the series fresh bear with it definitely after the fifth episode it gets ridiculously crazy and great so hold on if not just to watch the last half of the season because it's mm-hmm. it's great tv right yep agreed 100 percent agreed all right so we wrapped up you in a nice little box full of dead people's teeth <laughs> that <laughs> that's a good scary. one from the toilet uh, but like to bring about uh, uh so these are virgin ears our whole virgin ears um discussion which we will get into another one where we find something that we really want to get into depth to uh these bonus ones we're doing right now is just something we like to mention um it usually happens say you're with your friends you're like hey did you ever play this do you ever do that it's something like that and that's sort of the whole basis of our podcast here is just like me and tony like talking about things that maybe one of us hadn't played or something like that. And that sort of jump point us into this uh, podcast here. So I have a version ears for you, Mr. Tony. It is okay. a video game. Oh, oh. oh actually, it's, it's kind of two things. 
Okay. Um, it's one of those uh, things that is sort of all encompassing. Uh, my question to you is uh, how knowledgeable are you of the Alien franchise? None. <laughs> oh, yeah? Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. That's as a, great. Yeah, so as a matter of fact, I believe I've seen bits and pieces of the original Alien movie, um, Great. But, but I've never sat down and watched it from beginning to end. Sorry, now, I know it's um, a classic. Question, Go ahead. is it the movie slap bits and pieces of, do you remember if it was called Alien or Aliens? Oh, gee. I, hell no, I don't remember. <laughs> the, only <thing> I re <laughs> the only thing I remember is like, like, um scenes and it, it felt old it nice. felt like it, was, like it was one of the first ones you know okay i want to say that was probably the very first one so you know enough if you saw a big sort of black creature with the tail hissing at you you know to run the opposite direction right yeah 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 <laughs> okay so uh, what i'm talking about today is called alien isolation it is mm. a game based on the alien movie so um as the trilogy goes, and it's very confusing. The first movie is called Alien because it was set on a spaceship where there was one alien creature that was the whole menace to the whole um, first movie. Then the second movie is called Aliens, where they find out there's a shitload of hives of aliens that are the antagonists of that movie. And then continuing on after that, it's just like fucking all the aliens ever <laughs> okay but um so um and then the recent ones they kind of did a soft reboot themselves that sort of continues the alien covenant which we introduced so prometheus was like the prequel alien covenant reintroduced the creature of the alien and it's all good stuff so alien isolation another sort of soft reboot is a game about um so the main character is ripley and uh, this in um, Alien, and then in Alien Isolation, it's actually about her uh, daughter who tries to figure out what happened to her in the first Alien movie. And with sort of space travel, um, if ships go missing, they don't know where the hell is. And like, um, you put yourself in a cryo sleep for years and years. I think actually, I think between. Alien, the first movie, and Aliens, the second movie, it's a crazy time jump, like 30 or 50 years or something like that, or even 100, and then oh, wow. uh, Ripley wakes up to find she's the only one survived uh, the spaceship, because I think shit happened to other people's cryo beds and shit, and then she finds that, yeah, her, her daughter's probably lived a long, healthy life and uh, died for something. But in this one, um, it's some years after she goes missing, and her daughter is an adult now, and she's trying to investigate what happened to her mother. Okay. Um, so, this is a game, but what's great is IGN, who is our uh, media outlet, video games, that all thing. They have a YouTube channel, everything you can have. What is great is they took the story from Alien Isolation, which is a great story for any video game, and they placed it into a series, a full-length mini YouTube series, and they actually added exclusive new story footage to it, so it's its own sort of movie that you can watch now. So, so it's a... Wait, I'm kind of lost. It's a video game? Yes! that they took the scenes from to make a movie that just clipped them together? Yes, correct. So this video game in, oh, I want to say it came out uh, in 2010 or 2012, okay. the video game launch. Uh, first person horror video game with freaking Alien, and it's freaking ridiculous, because just, if you think the movie was scary, this game just is 10 times it puts you in the seat. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and survival horror, mostly, and like the alien, you can't really kill. Um, so you have to just survive. 
Um, and then, so they took the story of this video game just recently, uh, a couple months ago, or even the beginning of this year, I think. They uh, made it into a mini series on YouTube with collaboration with people who were originally made, and they made new footage. So it's not just you know gameplay. Oh, okay. So hmm. it's it's its own thing, and it's great to watch if you're a fan of the Alien series, or even if you're not a fan of the Alien series, it'd be interesting to get into this, and then maybe watch the old movies. Because after I did the game, I did wa- rewatch the old movies and it was hand. Well, that's incredible. That's a really cool way of doing it. Huh. So I wonder yes. if it would make more sense for me since I'm a new a newbie in this realm. I wonder if it would make more sense to play a video game or watch the movie first. Well, uh, it takes... I forget how many game player hours it is. Um, it's not that long, though. It's It's definitely doable. But I would at least watch the first Alien movie and then get into this. And then after uh, Alien Translation, you can get into all the other Alien movies, which there are a lot. Yeah. Um, I think after Aliens and then uh, a whole trilogy, Alien, Aliens, and then there's uh, Aliens 3, which they call it 3, but it's actually the second title with Alien, not Alien, which is really confusing uh, saying that it out is- loud. <laughs> um, but the <laughs> classic trilogy of Aliens is golden. That is great movie watching right there. Um, huh. Then when you get into the crazy sequels, it's ridiculous. But I brought it back, and what's really genius from uh, the filmmaker Ridley Scott, when they made Prometheus, they didn't mention Alien at all. No one knew it was going to be an Alien movie. But then it turned out to be an Alien prequel. And then after that, the prequel sequel, which is Alien Covenant. Dude, that sounds like I need a like Venn diagram to connect the dots. It is, it's one of those franchises like Dragon Ball Z, as we discussed, yeah. which is just really freaking confusing. But I think it's just really masterful in a way. That's incredible. Hmm. Well, all right. Well, I mean, if you're recommending it, I gotta check it yes. out. Alien is a great franchise for uh, anyone to get into and uh, I, I definitely wasn't a horror guy growing up um, but I knew about it from like my brothers and stuff my older brother yeah. going back and, like watching this I'm like oh it's pretty awesome actually <laughs> awesome man cool right. I do believe you have a version ears for me I do so here at this podcast I like to say we are into nostalgia and um, one of my favorite series of video games, it's no secret, is the Call of Duty series. And, you know, it's no secret that the last couple games, other than the most recent, personally, I really enjoyed it. But the ones previous to that, the uh, the Infinite Warfare, the, the freaking, I don't even know how many different video games there are, but they've been kind of so losing many. my attention. I, I lost, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I really lost my attention. And I didn't really follow the series, which is a bummer because it was one of my favorite ones. But I did recently hear there was a classic Call of Duty game that wasn't just recently remastered, but more more importantly, was being released for free for PlayStation Plus members. Uh, Oh, you lucky, lucky people. (laughs) And this game is, of course, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare Remastered Edition. And it was released for free as a PS Plus member. And, you know, sometimes the PS Plus games are, are hit or miss. But this one, man, it just brought me back to 2007. That's great. It is such a fun game. And one thing I was nervous about when I downloaded this game is, you know what? There's not going to be a lot of people playing the multiplayer. Boy, <laughs> was, I, boy was I wrong. Yes, there is a dedicated fan base there. And I do agree with you. I got sort of... Because there was an oversaturation in the market for Call of Duty. Definitely got um, confused with the franchise down the line. But um, picking it out, you can kind of understand it. Most of the Black Ops and the Modern Warfare, they have a core story together. They actually link up together. It's just all the other installments that do not and that are ridiculous. 
Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I was doing some research for this for this podcast, and I actually found a couple of surprising things that I didn't know about, and I don't know if you knew about, that this was the first Call of Duty game to feature killstreaks. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's probably. They invented a lot of the things we take for granted for um, most Mod- uh, competitive esports sort of first-person shooter Perfect. games. That Modern Warfare definitely invented a lot of the things. Yeah, I agree. I think it was it's a staple of modern single-player first-person shooters. Um, it also yes. has the ability to again. This is kind of like mind blowing because I thought this was I. I thought this has been going on for well before 2007, but it was the first game to feature, at least in the COD series, to feature um, different uh, positions. So you can do standing, nice. crouching, and prone. And uh, you know, <clears throat> I, certainly for for the COD series, I believe. No, that's the actually, first. I think um, the first one had that too. But I think Call of Duty de- definitely introduced those first positions because before we had uh, battlefield which was just standing and prone and then uh call of duty added the the third position there i think that they definitely uh, not modern warfare but definitely um call of duty the very first one did introduce that oh really they had crouching and standing yes, and prone. And what's also interesting is um the very first call of duty i remember was the first game i ever played that showed a kill cam too Yes, yeah, yeah, that that was unique to that game at that time. Um there are no uh the thing <laughs> so, so I prefaced the conversation by saying I really enjoyed the current latest rendition of the Call of Duty games. It's called Call of Duty um Black, Black Ops Internet? 4. Oh, the Black Ops, yes. And in that game, um you actually something different and unique about that game is you actually have to hold the left trigger button to heal. And so nice. I had been I had been acclimated to like holding that button, holding that button, so I could get getting he- healed. And when I went to this game, and I was holding that button, I kept launching grenades. I can't. I can't, I can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> Damn it! Like it was just funny, like the transition. But you don't have to do that self healing, um, which I think is also different from the previous games. I think there was. Yeah, that I think was definitely was, different. Mm-hmm. I think the other games had um, like health health packs. I think. Yes, so, exactly. That's that's how it started was health packs, and then they had a sort of auto heal, um, as you've seen in uh, Modern Warfare Remastered. And then, yeah, then that's great. I didn't know that about Black Ops that you can self heal. Yeah. So anyway, um, and I think actually, so I'm just speaking strictly about the multiplayer, but I think the campaign itself is one of the most fun campaigns in the Call of yeah. Duty series. Best, best, one of the best stories, if not um, from the very first one, had a really good story too. One of the best stories in a Call of Duty game, yes. And you know what? It looks so good, the remastered edition. It looks yeah. very well sharp. It looks sharp. It doesn't look like a game that's over 10 years old. It's... It's every so often that big companies throw you a bone. And so I was really yeah. happy that, you know what, they said, you guys have paid enough for the PlayStation Plus. We'll, we'll give you this one. This one's on us. That's nice. But, That's great. I think they're like, we're going to do Inf- Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. And everyone's like, no. And they're like, okay, no, we're going to give you on Warfare Remastered too. And everyone's like, yeah, <laughs> That's what we really <laughs> wanted. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. So, anyway, I like, I like this game a lot, man. It brought me back in, to my college days, so it's, it's just a man. fun game. I've been wanting to get back into Call of Duty, and um, that's probably the route I would go. I'd probably go into Remastered as well. But I've heard good things of Black Ops 4 as well. Even their uh, tacked-on Battle Royale mode, I heard, was pretty good, too. Dude, so, Battle um, Royale. Yeah, I'm excited to go back into Call of Duty. Yeah, so um, to, I don't think uh, I'm not sure you would know better than I, but I don't know if the recent COD games are available on the Nintendo Switch because I know that's kind of the club that is your choice right now. Uh, so well, I'm, I'm I'm pretty between that, and I've been a long, long um, veteran uh, Xbox player as well. So I guess my preference is Xbox One, and then I have the Switch as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm an Xbox guy, I guess. That's what I've learned about myself throughout the years. 
<laughs> that's funny. Yeah, and I think it's crazy because it pulls at your heartstrings. I've, I've gone through, you know, you know this. I've been through many up and downs, reading the three sixties, frying yeah. on me, and yeah. But I always like, I always gave them a shot. I always like, here we go. And like, I have to say, now is probably the best time to be an Xbox player. Now is like, now they're way better, <laughs> and now we have great hardware, and it's just gonna get better from here. You know what? Um, I would be happy to go back to Xbox, but right now there's no. So, long story short, the only reason I got into Xbox many, 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 many years ago was because of one game, one game only. Yes, of that course. Left, left for Dead, you know it. That yes. game got me hooked, and then ever since then, I, that was my actually my first next gen console, the Xbox 360. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Not and a bad I, one. No, and it, dude, that game, that console, it's still alive somewhere in this house, and I, I miss it. You know what? Maybe I'll plug it back in because talk about nostalgia, man. That console is amazing. So many hits, but I've, I've been absent because I got the PS4, yes. and I'm, I'm kind of happy. No, I am, I'm really happy with it. But so I guess I'm just saying I haven't found a need to go back to the Xbox. Oh. But, but you're telling I mean, me that um, if you ever do, uh, I definitely strongly promote it. And if you ever do, uh, another catch-all for me is a backwards compatibility, my man. When I got into uh, my Xbox One, I was like, I can have any freaking games on there to play. Oh, but yeah. And then yeah. Um, I did purchase some games digitally for my 360. But then I go onto my Xbox One library and the system, I'm like, oh, there's not going to be anything. But they actually give me all of my games that are now backwards compatibility now. So I have my collection back. Are you serious? That's incredible. Yeah. And um, actually at the time, which was great, uh, just recently I bought Advanced Warfare, which was one of the last games I bought for the 360. And then I got Xbox One, and they gave me a free copy of Advanced Warfare on Xbox One when I got my new console. That's incredible. So wait, you're saying, okay, so... Are all Xbox 360 games both physical and digital backwards compatible on the one? Um, not all of them. There's a list, a handy little list online. Most of the big popular games are, and they keep on adding more as the months go on. I keep on looking at the list each month to see what, which ones are um, being added on to the backwards compatibility list, and then looking <laughs> and looking back in my purchase. Did I buy it online before? Um, oh, but, so so it's only the digital games though, not the physical. No, the physical too. So say uh, I had a physical of shit. What's a backwards compatibility? Uh, so the original Gears of War is backwards compatible now. So say I had a physical disc of uh, a 360 disc of Gears of War. I pop that into my Xbox One, and what that does is allow me to download it free of charge from the store after I pop in the disc. Wait a minute, what's to prevent people from just going to Redbox and just doing that? Absolutely. You know? Honor system, sir, I guess. <laughs> you, wait, in order to play the game, you don't need to lock the disc first? No, no. You just pop it in, and I'll take you to download. I thought about doing that, too, by the way. Wait, and really? I, yeah, that's probably that a great sense. way to do it, too. But yeah, I, just honor system, and yeah. I'll be damned. Wow, thanks, Xbox and Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, so I would say uh, look at, um, turn on your 360, look at what digital purchase you have, and then you can even uh, search up backwards compatibility list for Xbox One and see if those uh, games will be on there for you, and then you'll still have a, lo a collection still. Stupid question. Can you still play or games online on the Xbox 360, or did they turn yes. that off? Also, if you turn your 360 on and you want to play Left 4 Dead, let me know. I got my Left 4 Dead on backwards compatible on my Xbox One. We can play again. What? <laughs> I'm, oh, just wait. I'm just waiting for people to jump on the Xbox bandwagon. <laughs> oh, wait. I just realized, though, I need to have the subscription pass. You need to have gold. Um, but now gold is pretty awesome. Uh I I really felt what you felt with the PS Plus because when I had a PS4, there was definitely a hit or misses for the yeah. title. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. for the 360, the lot, the 
games you get with uh, live gold for free each month have just been great hits one after the other. And not only do they give you Xbox One games, but they also give you a th- couple 360 games every month as well. Wow. Maybe yeah, I so I'm play- playing old games. I'm playing new games. It's it's great stuff. Dude, you're kind of making me want to go turn it on, dust it off. Maybe I will. Maybe I will just get a one month pass just to you know see how it I have. Fun. I have some if you'd like. Huh. All right. Well, this this podcast turned into an interesting concept <laughs> discussion. <laughs> yeah, I really did. <laughs> now this is right. I mean, this is a peer into our lives. This is just me uh, and Tony conversation now. <laughs> this is how our conversations actually really go in real life. So it's kind of fun to share it. All right, yeah. buddy. Well, that's it for me in terms of like uh, Virgin Years bonus. Uh, I had one more. Um, I'll just tell you the name of it. You can look up at uh, YouTube. Uh, actually, an RPG game. I want us to get back into RPG games like um, Dungeons and Dragons. I know the main thing is it takes a shitload of time and effort, but I would like to get back in, into it somehow. Um, there's this game called Fiasco, which if you like thrillers, like Netflix, you this is kind of puts you in. Uh, an RPG of that, pretty much. So what it is, is a storytelling game in which you get three to five players together. There's no, like, in Dungeons & Dragons, there's a storyteller who tells the story and gets the action going. Yeah. That is everyone in this game. Everyone says what's going on, and what happens is um, you get these... So it's fiasco, and it's based on, like, crime movies, thriller movies... Um, and you get this character, you create a character in the story that you all come together in, and you have to get your character to get what he wants. You need to get your character's goals, but everyone else is doing the same thing. So it's it's a crazy sort of storytelling game. Huh. That sounds interesting, actually. I like the so concept. If of- you got time, uh, look up Fiasco. Look at Will We who is a course they play it on tabletop and uh so yeah. look up fiasco will we, and you'll should see uh one where they do about uh i think it's like 70s disco themed game yeah i'm looking at it now that's interesting huh all right man yeah this sounds interesting i want to look and then you'll see like the sort of um twist and turns that netflix you guess it kind of happens within the game too sweet Awesome. Thanks, man. I'll, I'll take a look at it. Sweet. All right. Well, then, damn, that's a lot on our plate now. <laughs> that is. Like it is. Uh, so next time around, uh, we do want to continue more with Dragon Ball. But uh, next time around, we'll do a fresh new uh, version of Ears. And maybe we'll get revisit it next you as well. But we'll do a fresh new version of Ears where we're going to pick another uh, subject or two subjects of what we are going to go more in depth into next time. Okay, agreed. Uh, final thoughts uh, for you, Tony. Um, final thoughts for me is give uh, Netflix's you a shot. Be on the lookout for season two. Uh, it's supposed to be premiering this year, sometime this year, so that'll be exciting. Uh, roll with it, guys. I know it might be a slow burn, but at the end, it's just it's fantastic. And... Um, Sorry for all the spoilers if you guys haven't seen the show already, but it's still fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I would. Uh, yeah, oh, hopefully this uh, gets you into actually watching the show. And yeah, I would say exactly what Tony said and give it a try. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to where what adventures we're gonna have next for me and Tony on geeking this. Uh, see you later, guys. See ya.